Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at New Testament geography, this time focusing upon Antioch. The city of Antioch, and first let's uh, see it on the big map, and then we're going to zoom into this uh, very much smaller area. Here we see Antioch located on the Orontes River, uh, this river flowing northward, and then it swings around uh, to to move toward the southwest before it flows into the Mediterranean. The city was founded by Seleucus I, uh, also known as Nicator. Uh, Seleucus had been a commander under General Ptolemy, Ptolemy who had been one of Alexander the Great's commanders, um, and then in that in that breakup of Alexander's empire, uh, each of the generals and, and commanders had each tried to grab a part of Alexander's kingdom. Ptolemy had sent Seleucus up as his representative to to fight against uh, some of those Greek generals, and he had managed to capture uh, all of Mesopotamia and this portion of the Levant. And not only did he capture it, he kept it for himself, uh, and and uh, much to the chagrin probably of of Ptolemy. So the city was was founded by him, named for his father Antiochus, and we're going to see a few different people from that family by the name of Antiochus, including Antiochus the uh, Fourth, known to the Jews as Antiochus Epimenes, Antiochus the Madman, the one who came down and desecrated the temple. This became the Seleucid capital in those days of the Maccabees. It followed the same general plan as the city of Alexandria because it was a Greek city. And so uh, here is also a Greek city built by Greeks, inhabited by Greeks, although it Eventually, you're going to see people of the land and the community also coming into the area. The city had seen expansion under Emperor the Roman Emperor Octavius Augustus. Uh, so by now, it had become a Roman city. Uh, a hippodrome was added, that is, a you know, big arena for chariot racing. Uh, Titus had come to the city after the fall of Jerusalem, and he had set up the Jerusalem Carabim, these statues, not the ones that were on the, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had long been lost. But there were additional statues. Remember, the uh, the temple had had big giant statues of Carabim, and these were brought up to Antioch and placed over one of the gates as a as a signal, Jerusalem is no more. It has ceased to exist. Now, it really hasn't ceased, but uh, for all intents and purposes, it wasn't a major city anymore. And now these were placed here at Antioch. Here's an artist's conception of the city, the way it would have looked back then. Notice it's on the edge of uh, Mount Silpias. There's a big mountain that even today is over there, and portions of the wall would be seen over there. And then you see the Orontes River actually splitting with an island uh, that contains part of the city uh, being created uh, as the river continues its way uh, off the right side of our screen and making its way eventually to the Mediterranean Sea. Here's another picture from the same, just different angle. Notice the the aqueduct running through the city, bringing water. You say, well, why would they need water? Um, that's so that you can have running water in the city, not just water that's brought to a local place, like like to a local well. Also notice there's a an amphitheater in the foreground, and you can see the hippodrome on the island in the distance. Here again is a a map. This is complements of uh, Biblical Bible Archaeology Digest. Uh, you can see the hippodrome, the new city, the old city, the various theaters, the amphitheater, uh, different additions. Uh, a wall, one wall that had been built in the days of Tiberius, another wall much later by Justinian, that Christian emperor of the Byzantine Empire, although he would have called himself uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, so you just get a better sense of the city and and the mountains and the walls that were there. Now, it was uh, we said it was a Roman city, so you're going to have Roman um, idols and statues. Here's Tyche, the Romans referred to as Fortune. And the city remains even today. I'm borrowing this picture from a, uh, a, web, a tourist website, uh, Antakya. 
is uh, the name of the city. I'm not sure if I pronounce it right, but you can still see the the mountain, uh, Mount Sulpius in the background and the modern day city. It has remained a city all these years. Now, in the New Testament, here's how it comes into play. We had in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, after the Jews had been scattered. So those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to the Jews alone. So you begin having the expansion of Christianity, but it's a very selective expansion. It's only, it's only an expansion among Jewish people. It is not reaching out to Gentiles, even though by this time Peter had had his vision with the with the uh, the the big blanket being let down from heaven, full of full of uh, various sorts of animals to take and and kill and eat, and don't call what I have made unclean. And and it wasn't really about eating; it was really about the Gentiles. Uh, but that hasn't caught on yet. However, verse 20, we read, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch, and now they began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Very slowly at first, and in this place first, we begin to see the gospel being go- going out to Gentiles. Verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord, the news about them reached the ears of Jerusalem of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent uh, they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Barnabas had been one of those uh, believers early on in the city of Jerusalem, uh, and he sent out as a representative to check out this uh, idea. Gentiles for Jesus. We're not, you know we're not sure how that's going to go. Verse twenty five, and he left for Tarsus. So before going to Antioch, he, he he swings over to Tarsus to look for Saul. This is the same Saul who had been persecuting the church, but who had now become Saul the Christian. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, Antioch, then, is going to, we're going to see, in the same way they had reached out to Gentiles, they're going to have a mission focus of sending out, first, you're going to have Paul and Barnabas, Saul, as he's known initially, but uh, later on, we'll see his name is also Paul. And then when, in a later journey, when Paul and Barnabas aren't seen eye to eye, it will be Paul and Silas and Barnabas and John Mark. And so we'll see not one, but several mission teams sent out by this church, which becomes the the epitome of a mission-sending church. Now, later in its history, after, after Christianity had become legalized, and you have the Pope, starting with Constantine, and most of the ones after him are going to say, well, I'm a Christian too. Now, they, I don't know that they all were. Um, but you come to his nephew, Julian, and he's known as Julian the Apostate, because even though he'd been brought up with Christian teaching, he had rejected it. And Julian, he, now that he's emperor of Rome, he actually comes to Antioch. And in Antioch, there were some pagans still there. It was a largely a Christian city, but there were there were pagans there, uh, pagans at the temple of of Apollo, and they were complaining. Uh, you know, we have these these uh, this church here, and and under the church are the bones of a martyred bishop, and the Christians revere that, and that's messing up our paganism. Uh, we're not able to do our our pagan prophecies because of the bones of this martyred bishop. And so Julian, who had no love for Christians, uh, he moved the bones of the bishop and the Christians came out and complained. They actually, nothing violent, uh, but they came out and they all said, you know, you shouldn't have been doing that. That's that's something that we treasure. And after that, a fire broke out in that temple of Apollo, and, and Julian immediately proclaimed the Christians and arrested a bunch of them and closed down the church. And then it, then investigation showed, no, the fire had been by accident, had nothing to do with the Christians. Uh, and it was a, a year or so later where Julian himself was killed in fighting against the Parthians. The story goes that as he lay on the battlefield, uh, raised his fist to heaven and said, you have conquered Oh, Galilean. I don't know if that part really happened. That's a later story that's told. But with regard to Antioch, we see after this a school at Antioch being developed 
Uh, there were actually two major schools. There was one down in Alexandria, which had a tendency to to uh, be more involved in in sort of the abstract and and sort of uh, involved in in very picturesque interpretations, in allegorical interpretations. And by contrast, the School of Antioch would say, uh, took the approach, no, we're going to just say what's in the Bible, what's, what's literally there, just take the common sense meaning of the passage and see what it means and how does it apply to us. Uh, so a very, a very uh, good school, uh, well-grounded, that produced people like Chrysostom and uh, Theodore of Montepius, and, and others that were, were excellent preachers and teachers. Now, it's later history. Uh, we're eventually going to see uh, the Byzantine Empire go at war with the Persians, and uh, the city will be captured by the Persians and then taken back, and, and then you'll have the Muslim conquests. And to, to this day, Antioch is a Muslim city. And yet that reminds us that a missionary-sending church might not be there long term, but like a seed that falls to the ground and dies, a church might disappear and yet have left a host of seeds in which it grows a great forest. And that is the story of Antioch.